So Professor Smith, it's such a pleasure to see you again. I know that you were one of the, the main characters in the One Carbon Metabolism research field. You've been working in this field for quite a long time. Can you tell me uh, what type of research you've been doing and for how long? Yes, uh, surprising that, to think. I actually uh, studied B6 deficient animals back in 1959. My very first paper, in fact, was a letter to Nature about B6 deficient rats. And uh, already then I got interested in one carbon metabolism, but I, I didn't do any further work on that field until 1996. Okay. Uh, when I've been wor working on Alzheimer's disease for nearly 10 years and we discovered the link between one carbon metabolism and Alzheimer's disease yes. in our cohort called Optima in yes. Oxford, which o Optima stands for Oxford Project to Investigate Memory and Aging. Yeah. And we'd been recruiting people with memory problems or dementia and controls uh, for nearly 10 years <clears throat> and we collected blood samples, did brain scans and, and cognitive tests and we discovered together with Helga Refsum in uh, Norway that these people had high levels of the amino acid homocysteine which is a one carbon marker for poor status of folate and B12 and B6. Yeah. So we looked uh, of course at uh, uh, these two, these three B vitamins and we found indeed that people with Alzheimer's had low levels of folate and low levels of B12. And that's indeed what you were talking about today. That's what I was talking about today and we followed this up um, by doing a trial to see if lowering homocysteine by giving these three B vitamins would have any effect on, on the brain and in particular on cognition and the rate of brain shrinkage or atrophy. Mm -hmm. And you did this with patients with mild cognitive impairments. That's right. We decided it would be it's too late to intervene in people with Alzheimer's disease because mm -hmm. so much of the brain has, has degenerated and they've lost their memories. You're not going to be able to replace the memories or replace the, the brain tissue. Whereas people with mild cognitive impairment, they're only mod very slightly impaired, as, as the title sounds like. They live in the community. They have an impairment in one or two cognitive functions. Um, but they, they otherwise have no problems mm. and unfortunately for them mild cognitive impairment is a major risk factor for Alzheimer's so about half of them will go on to develop dementia or usually Alzheimer's right. in the five-year period. And what was the intervention that you gave them specifically well, and for how long? We chose high, high levels of these three B vitamins because we wanted to get the homocysteine level down mm -hmm. maximally and it had been shown in other studies that you can get it down if you give high levels of folic acid, vitamin B12 and vitamin B6. So the levels we chose were much higher than you'd ever get from any food, but they're the sort of levels that work and they're quite safe uh, pharmacologically. The trial was designed to measure the rate of shrinkage of the brain because you can do that very accurately, much more accurately than you can measure cognitive um, things like memory. Um, but of course we did measure cognition and if the method we use to measure the shrinkage of the brain uh, is accurate to 0.2% per mm -hmm. year. Now the people with mild cognitive impairment, their brain is shrinking rough, approximately 1% per year, whereas normal elderly, uh, the brain is shrinking half that rate, okay. half of 1% per year. So we had a, you know, we felt we had a a margin to, to, to aim for and the, the trial was powered, that means we recruited enough subjects so that we could um, detect a 20% slowing of brain atrophy by the B vitamin right. treatment. And is brain atrophy through imaging, is that recognized by clinicians? It's, it's a research tool. Mm -hmm. I would say it's coming to be recognized more and more and um, in a, in a clinic, if you get someone with memory problems, you'll probably send them for an MRI scan, okay. almost certainly nowadays, to see if the, the parts of the brain that involve in memory, like the hippocampus, are shrunken. Yeah. So it's coming along. But it's, it's not a, a formal endpoint in clinical trials as recognized by the FDA, for example. Okay. But, but I think it's coming. I think it will be soon. So it's not recognized as a drug uh, not yet. Uh, development no. outcome? But I think it okay. will be. So we gave them the B vitamins for two years and we did a brain scan at the beginning, brain scan at the end and using this wonderful software developed in Oxford by my colleague Steve Smith, 
you can do the subtraction of the two volumes very yeah. accurately and we were able to measure the rate of shrinkage in the placebo group and the other half who took B vitamins and in the placebo group the rate of shrinkage was 1.1% per year which is about what we'd expected mm -hmm. but in the B vitamin group it was down to 0.7% per year okay. so we had a 30% slowing on average of brain shrinkage in this trial. So you found that the intervention group had a lower rate of atrophy. Yeah. Was that independent of their homocysteine levels? No, that was an ex extremely important point. We predicted in advance that um, those with a high homocysteine level would show a bigger effect. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we split the homocysteine level into four categories uh, called quartiles, it was exactly what we predicted. So those in the bottom quartile, they didn't show any effect of B vitamin treatment. You began to see an effect in the second and in the third and fourth quartiles of a big slowing of atrophy, such that in the fourth quartile, the rate of shrinkage of the brain was reduced by 53%. 53%, and over how long of a time was the trial? That was two years. So within two years, you see effects of B vitamins on yeah. brain atrophy. Yeah. That's remarkable, isn't it? Remarkable result. It was much better than we could have really ever hoped for. Mm -hmm. So we were encouraged by that result on brain atrophy to to analyze the cognitive data which we collected. I mean, we, we were going to analyze it anyway, but this really encouraged us. And we found to our delight that uh, the people on the B vitamins um, showed a much slower cognitive decline in several different cognitive domains, including memory, okay. executive function, and things like that. And um, so this, this meant it had a clinical significance. Yeah. And in the nutrition literature or research, is there anything comparable to that effect size of finding an effect on brain atrophy of that rate within two years? No, no, not, not at the moment. I mean, that was really... And with exact. drugs, are there...? That's, uh, the, there's no drug that's been shown to do that in, in um, mild cognitive impairment. In fact, the, there are no drugs that slow brain atrophy that I'm aware of. Amazing. Yeah. So, in the sense, it's, it's a first, yeah. and we think it's an example of m disease modification, as we call it, when you, the disease process, which is revealed by the brain atrophy, can actually be slowed down. Yeah. So we went one step further, together with um, Steve Smith and his team in Oxford, in the Functional Magnetic Resonance in Centre. Um, we looked at the regional changes in the brain over two years, and this turned out to be even more surprising, even more dramatic. So we found that just certain parts of the brain were shrinking in people with mild cognitive impairment, which has been known mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. But what was so striking was that the B vitamin treatment actually slowed down just those parts of the brain that were shrinking, which are known to be involved in Alzheimer's. Yeah. And the effect was quite amazing in the people with high homocysteine only, uh, not the people with low homocysteine, the B vitamins slowed down the rate of regional brain atrophy right. by a factor of nine. Hmm. And you know, if you had a drug effect like that, you'd yeah. be extremely happy in any, any clinical yeah. situation. Well, exactly, and I have to say your talk was very well received today. Okay. Uh, when you've presented these results to the Alzheimer's disease yeah. field, how was that received? That's an interesting question. They, they were very impressed. And I, I presented these results as, as a major drug company that's actively trying to develop anti-Alzheimer's drugs. And the people came up to me and said, wow, if that was a drug, we'd be extremely yeah. happy. We'd be billionaires and that sort of thing. But nothing happens. Yeah. This is the sad thing about it. it it's, people are impressed by the actual results, but they don't do, there's no implications for practice yet, except in Sweden. What we think, it's a very small trial, obviously, less than 200 people, but the results are really robust. I think everyone agrees that. Um, <clears throat> so since the intervention is safe, mm -hmm. B vitamins, we think that the sensible thing to do is in a memory clinic, you measure the person's homocysteine if they have myocardial impairment. If it's above 11, you say to them, there was a trial done in Oxford and it showed that taking B vitamins helps people with this level of homocysteine and would you like to have them? Yeah. And for me that that seems the only ethical thing to do. Mm -hmm. You know, you have you have a result which has clear implications 
I've worked out that 30,000 elderly people a year in the UK alone could benefit from this intervention. And in, the, in America, months. it's three and a half million, yeah. uh, roughly. Because we know the level of homocysteine in the elderly. We know how many of them have mild cognitive impairment. So, you know, I just would like people to think about that. Now, it happens that in Sweden, um, they've adopted this policy. I'm very pleased to say. Uh, I gave a talk in Gothenburg mm, about three years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, I ended up with a similar slide today saying that implications are that you know, it might be good to test people for homocysteine. We already do that. We already give them B vitamins after your first paper. Yeah, so well, that was very nice to yeah. hear. So um, what, what are your next steps then? Well, <clears throat> we, the, there are two things we wanted to do and we've been trying to do for some time. The first one, which is to do a large scale trial mm -hmm. in many centers. It was obviously in, in one center about 200 is about as many as you can get. International or within the UK? Well, it, originally we planned it within the UK. We, we identified 10 centres who were very keen to recruit people mm -hmm. with mild cognitive impairment. And the idea was to, to give them the same dose of B vitamins, but instead of a brain atrophy endpoint, we wanted to look at the endpoint of clinical dementia. Mm -hmm. Because clearly the, the most convincing thing for a clinician is to show that you can actually slow down or prevent people converting to dementia from cognitive impairment. And we submitted it to one, one of the UK funding agencies, a government supported one, and it was turned down. Um, we then, you have to wait a year, and then we submitted it to the other UK funding agency, and it was turned down. Hmm. So we're rather fed up about that. Um, but in the meantime, we've been analyzing the, the, the blood samples from the Vitacorp patients, the, the cohort of the trial, uh, and we've measured the omega-3 fatty acid levels in these um, people, and we found a really striking thing that the B vitamins will only slow brain atrophy in people whose omega-3 fatty acid levels are high at baseline. So they interact, these two nutrients, and it's a robust effect. It, it worked on brain atrophy. It also worked on cognition. So Cognitive decline was only slowed by B vitamins in those who had a good omega-3 status. So does that mean then that the B vitamin supplementation was beneficial for those with a high homocysteine, which yeah. is a negative risk yes. factor, or a population that had high levels of omega-3 well, fatty acids? Uh, you need to have both. You need to have both. Okay. Yeah. And, and the uh, slowing of atrophy in the people with high homocysteine originally was 30% on average, mm -hmm. but in those with high homocysteine and high omegas, it was 70% slow. Amazing. It is. That's just been accepted for publication, so hmm. we're happy and we're communicating it in Boston next Excellent. week. Excellent. Yeah. So the next trial we'd like to do is, of course, yeah. a combination trial, factorial design, where we give um, one lot of patients placebo, one lot B vitamins, one lot omega-3 fatty acids, and the other lot the combination of B vitamins and omega-3. And we've applied to the EU for that. Um, and we're uh, wait, waiting the result. Right. So that's, that's my next my next. Great plan. work, yeah. Well, you know, we, we think it's, it's got a high chance of success. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I would say considering that most of the drug development uh, efforts have led to very little so far, it's mm. amazing the work that you've done. Well. It's turned out remarkably well. What's so elegant is that there is a good theoretical reason why B vitamins should interact with omega-3 fatty acids. Yep. Dick Wormann mentioned it today in the meeting. The, um, the B vitamins are involved in the, form, in the conversion of phosphatidylethanolamine to phosphatidylcholine mm -hmm. um, by providing methyl groups. And the phosphatidylcholine in the brain is contains the high level of omega-3 fatty acids and it's very important for membrane and synaptic function. Yep. So that would fit really quite well yep. that you need both the B vitamins and the omega-3 fatty acids.